The title of today, this afternoon's session is Benchmarking for Success, What Does It Really Take to Be Internationally Competitive? And you know, when we started the ADP network and the research that undergirded it, we did uh, our research based on what does it take to be um, prepared for college and careers in this country? That was the question on our minds. If you were, no matter where you live in the country, uh, we wanted to make sure that your kids were graduating prepared to compete with their national peers. Now the, the context has changed. Uh, Tom Friedman released The World is Flat, and we all figured out that, in fact, the world really was flat. We didn't realize that before. Um, that our kids no longer just need to be competitive uh, with each other uh, from state to state, but they really are operating in a global context. And we need to be preparing students who are ready for college and careers um, and competing with kids from all over the world. So there's a newfound, um, rapidly growing interest in international benchmarking. Um, but we're not actually sure necessarily what that means. There's a lot of different ways to come at that. For example, in Ohio, they did a very robust study of their entire system and thought about how to internationally benchmark different pieces of uh, their delivery system. Tennessee has recently been to the EU to think um, about what the EU is doing and how that might inform their work. Achieve has our own study underway of standards from a number of countries. Um, and of course, the common core standards are, uh, the goal of the work to develop those common core standards is to make sure that they are internationally benchmarked um, so that kids completing a common core study uh, come out ready to compete. And we heard from Michael Barber earlier that they even can internationally benchmark how one opens the door of a taxi um, so that uh, when you come out of the taxi, you are greeted appropriately. So there's a lot of international <laughs> benchmarking activity going on, and we've assembled a great panel today to give us a little more insight about what exactly that means and how states might engage in that. Uh, we're gonna start with Sir Michael Barber. You've heard from him this morning. He's the expert partner from Global Public Sector Practice at McKinsey and Company. And he's going to really frame out the issues and then lead a conversation uh, about this. Uh, we're going to then have Bill Schmidt from Michigan State University. And he's going to talk about um, standards in particular, but what he's learned from benchmarking curricula internationally. Uh, and then we are going to turn to Andreas Schleicher, who's the head of indicators in the analysis division uh, for the organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. That's a mouthful. We know it as OECD. Uh, so I'm going to turn it right over to Andreas, who's going to lead a discussion. As I said, we want to keep the remarks up here fairly short, because we know you have a lot of questions. So there'll be time for question and answers. And then we'll end promptly at 2, because Andreas has to get to his next presentation, also about international benchmarking. Andreas. I'll try to do that. Thank you so much. I'd like to just spend a few minutes on the concept of benchmarking. Uh, not so much on the outcomes yet, but on what it means really to do that. And I think it's very important to keep in mind that there are several dimensions involved in road. First of all, it can be about looking at student outcomes. That's what we often talk about, benchmarking. How well have students acquired certain types of knowledge and so on. But it's also about looking about what's happening in instructional settings, in classrooms, in schools. How are those results produced? It is about the performance of service providers in education. Very, very important as well. How do schools perform? What is the variation performance? How consistent are results? And of course, it's about the performance of systems, about the outcomes. Sorry, uh, I don't see that coming up. So now it is there. <coughs> You talk about different levels of the stakeholders that you want to benchmark. And of course, the first question always is, what are the results? What are the outputs? And what do those outcomes, outputs imply in terms of their impact? For the learn, <coughs> but benchmarking, well, let, let's put it like this. I think it is a pity if benchmarking just stops at ranking schools or ranking countries and just seeing where you are. The key question is always what you can do to improve, and I think the very important part of the benchmarking process is to identify those policy levers that shape the outcomes that we observe and see what you can do about this. And no benchmarking makes sense without being able to contextualize the results. I mean, comparing different states, comparing different countries without understanding 
something about the context, the social and economic environment is very, very problematic. So we need to take that part into account as well. And I think that gives you sort of the complexity of the issue. Here, of course, we can benchmark the quality and distribution of knowledge and skills. That's the first thing people are interested in. How well do students do? This is harder to do. What about quality of instructional delivery and benchmarking studies here are at the very beginning internationally. Here we're doing better. The output and performance of institutions. When people talk about Finland and its great results on international studies, the most interesting part is that there's only about 4% of the performance variability in Finland between schools. Every school succeeds. That's where success becomes systemic. And so I think it's very important to look at this, not just at global performance, but at those kinds of attributes. And of course, people are always interested in the social and economic outcomes. What's the long term? That's really what competitiveness and benchmarking is about. What's the long term economic and social out, uh, outcome of learning? Here you can argue a lot. To what extent do you want to take into account the success of schools to engage students and learn? Students not only to be good in science, but to see to what extent science opens life opportunities for themselves. We try to do that in our benchmarking work. Here we want to talk about the teaching and learning practices, classroom climate and so on. It's hard to benchmark, very hard to measure, but very, very important. That's the front line of delivery. If you can't change that, you can't improve outcomes. Here we want to talk about the learning environment at school. I think we have quite good benchmarks on that, and this is about how you allocate money and things like this. And here, it's about basically the contextual conditions in which systems work. So I just wanted to show, highlight the complexity of benchmarking and just leaving it with the first column really just gives you a stale picture. When you know where you are but you don't see what you can learn from other systems to improve, it is not really satisfactory. i just give you a couple of examples. I mean, those things I marked in blue are quite easy to do now without Assessing learning outcomes, you can see what schools and systems produce in terms of output. I show you this in the picture. On the horizontal axis, you see how successful systems are. Every dot is one country. Though. On the horizontal axis, you see how successful systems are to produce degrees, graduates, college graduates. No? And you could put states in here. We have those data also for many states now. On the vertical axis, you see how much does it cost. And I'm going to make the picture even more complex. The size of the dot shows you where the money comes from. The larger the dot, the more private money goes into education. The more successful systems are to generate private money. The only thing I didn't say so far that this was about 1995, a decade ago. United States, number one in terms of output, number one in terms of cost. Here's Finland, middle in the pack in output, middle in the pack in terms of expansion. But then you see in the year 2000, things look different. You could see basically what was the benchmark. The United States is now the frontier. There are lots of countries at that level. You could see suddenly the UK coming out. They made a lot of progress between 1995 and 2000. Unfortunately, since then, it's been pretty flat. But you could see basically how things have changed. And look at Finland now. Well, this is Australia, also a country very successful. Remember where Finland was five years before? In the middle of the pack? Now number one. And the world didn't stop in the year 2000, as some people predicted. But you can see <laughs> things moving on. 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. No? So it gives you a taste of that benchmarking is not just about where you are, but how you progress in terms of qualifications. Here you could see the United States. You see it more or less where you saw it in 1995, Australia, Finland. That's sort of one slice of the cake. Very easy to do. You don't set international standards. You just look at what every country produces on the criteria of its own systems. These orange parts are harder to benchmark. No? What are countries actually doing? But I want to illustrate it with one point. And that's how countries spend their money. You know, we talk a lot about how much states and countries spend, but benchmarking becomes interesting when you look at how that money is invested. First of all, the red dot shows you more or less, and again, you could do it for states, you could do it for countries, how much countries spend on money that arrives in the classroom. Structural cost. Huh? 
the line is the OECD average above is pretty low. And you can see more or less the United States, for example, looks very low, even though it spends a lot of money. Why is that? Because comparative to other countries, so much less money arrives actually in the classroom. But you can actually look at this in comparisons to other countries and systems. Now, interesting is what drives those costs. If you pay your teachers a lot, that's where the bars go up, things become expensive. Now, you take Korea. Korea tries to get the best people into the teaching profession, and they pay them about twice in terms of GDP per capita than the United States does. Korea also wants to buy a lot of instructional hours. Makes the system even more expensive. And Korea wants to give its teachers time to do other things than teaching. That's the yellow, the orange part. So all of this pushes cost up. How does Korea pay for this? Large classes. That drives costs down. So you basically see this is a choice that a country makes. They want to get, get good teachers. They want to have long instruction hours for students. They want to have lots of opportunities for teachers to work beyond uh, teaching. And that drives costs up. And they pay for this with large classes. Let's pick another country. Luxembourg. The red dot is more or less where Korea is. No? Similarly expensive. But how does Luxembourg spend its money? Well. Parents in Luxembourg like small classes. Teachers like small classes. So all of the money is going into small classes. But also Luxembourg can spend its money only once. So you could see the price for this is short school days, lower salaries, little time for teachers to do anything than teaching. So the point I want to make here simply, and here you have the United States at the end, it's more or less in the middle of the two, but more like Luxembourg than like Korea, really. But everything at a much lower level of expenditure. But what I wanted to show you just is this is the potential of benchmark. You can see not just how much you invest, but you see how your choices differ from those in other countries. Now, you can't do that in an, at the national level because every state does these things in similar ways. You can do it when you look across systems that offer you policy alternatives. Another part, the red part. This is about individual performance, learning outcomes. That's something that is much harder to do, measuring what students can actually produce, the quality of learning outcomes. We have tried to do that with our PISA exams. There are other types of international comparisons as well, where we try to test young people at different ages. And you can actually then see how systems come up in terms of the quality of learning outcomes of kids. Now, that's another form of benchmarking, where you look at the performance of systems in terms of the learning outcomes achieved by students in different systems. And you can see there's huge variation. We took 15-year-olds in this example. 15-year-olds, they've all been born in the same year, and you can see 15 years later, they come out at very different levels of performance. That's another predictor for competitiveness, and we have now longitudinal data that actually show us that how strongly those outcomes predict future life success of people. It's another form of benchmark, and here, in most federal systems, we do that now by states. So here's Spain as an example. No? Spain doesn't do so well overall. But you can see some states in Spain do really quite well. And some states in Spain do quite poorly. Or take Italy. And I could put in Canada, I could put in Germany, I could put all of the federal countries, except the United States. But you can actually see how states and nations play out each other. Now you can see, for example, how does a state in Spain compared to a state in Italy or Germany or Switzerland or Belgium or the United Kingdom. And sort of, you can see basically how performance in different systems arises. I just want to spend one more minute on the issue of performance. This is about mathematics. And what you see here is the length of the bar shows you the variability of mathematics performance. Not the average, the variability. And I'm showing you this because Often when you look at this in a national perspective, you say, well, there must always be some variability in student performance. Some students are brighter than others and some are less so, so there must be some variability. But if that would be all about natural intelligence, then the bar would be of a similar length. But you can see, actually, it varies enormously across countries. Where does the variability in performance come from? You can benchmark that as well. You can divide this bar up. The light bar part shows you the variability inside schools, and the yellow bar shows you the variability between schools. And you can see the number one performer in the world, in OECD, Finland, 
every school succeeds. There's almost no variability in the performance of schools. It's a very important benchmark. It's what we call coherence in education performance. One question is, you get a few schools to do really well. Another question is, how do you get your system to perform? No? And this varies a lot across countries. No? Turkey, Hungary, Japan, Belgium, quite a lot of variability performance between schools. Benchmarking also shows you how the relative strengths and weaknesses of students differ in a field like science. Take French students. They're doing quite well in a science test in identifying what a problem is. They just don't have a lot of scientific knowledge, so they can't explain what they see very well. Using scientific evidence, they do really well. That goes for the right side. Basically, when they've figured out a problem and a problem has been presented to them, they can actually draw the correct inferences. French students have a lot of knowledge about science. They know what a hypothesis is, how you draw evidence, sort of, they know the paradigms of science. But when it comes to subject matter knowledge, Earth and space, really poor, living systems, biology, not so well, physics, also not so well. So you can see quite distinct patterns of an education system. And I'll show you another one. I make France now, the dotted line in the background is still France, so that you can see that still. No, but I show, show you now a typical Eastern European country. No? Look at that. Exactly the opposite. No? So you basically see what you do in instruction in science actually matters in terms of the learning outcomes that you achieve. You can see students in the Czech Republic or in Russia, they're not so familiar with the concepts of science, the paradigms of science but they're really good when it comes to subject matter knowledge. So international benchmarking can show you this, and when you want to hire an engineer, you know well, whether you would go to France or the Czech Republic. No? <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's what I mean. I think the, all I wanted to do really here is to give you an impression on the kind of dimensions that you need to look at, and benchmarking is really much more than just looking at an average of a state performance on any of those dimensions. Thank you very much. Where the heck would it be here? Is all of that on the thumb drive too? Was the question. I'm asking for a knowledgeable person. Yeah, me too. It will be org on Monday. So I'm going to Where take this little it? interlude to introduce Bill Schmidt. And Bill's going to, Andrea's just sort of laid out a context of, of the Got different it. ways to think about international benchmarking and, and why one might do it and, and how you can yeah. drill down and use the data um, to answer particular questions. Bill's done a lot of work looking at standards and curricula internationally. And, and that's one aspect that I know that Achieve's been interested in, many of you have been interested in as well. So we're going to hear from Bill about uh, what he's done, what he's found, and then hopefully in the question and answer, portion, someone will ask him whether individual states should be doing some benchmarking as well, or there's something more collective we could be doing along the lines of international benchmarking on standards. Bill. Okay. Um, I couldn't have been better set up for my remarks than uh, Andreas's conversation, especially the second part of it, because he talked about it's not just enough to uh, benchmark on the achievement side, the performance side but that you want to look at various policy levers that may well impact uh, what those different, where those difference uh, from, which they're, from where they arose. And that's what I want to talk about because clearly everyone knows that uh, the international studies, the TIM, the IEA studies and the PISA studies, the OECD studies, have all led to one inevitable conclusion that there's a great deal of relationship between what students are expected to learn and given opportunities to learn and what they then do learn. His last couple slides about the Eastern Europeans versus uh, France give you an indication, because I would bet, in fact, the standards of those two countries are quite different as well, telling the teachers what it is they're supposed to uh, be teaching in those classrooms. And so I want to talk about this, this kind of international benchmarking, which I think is extremely important, and that is to understand the nature of the expectations, what we call the standards, uh, curriculum standards, the various names people give it to it across the world. But the question is, how then do you do such a task? Um, well, many I have heard different states and different districts sometimes simply take on the task of looking at a particular country who happens to have won 
the last race. Uh, for a while, Japan was the favored one. Now it's Singapore, now it's Finland. It changes, but basically people go out and look specifically at those countries. I'm not sure that necessarily that's the best way to do something like benchmarking of, inner, of standards. I think a better way is to look at a collection of countries because it's not necessarily true that any one should be copied in any sense because there are cultural traditions. There are other kinds of traditions within the countries that might make things more specific in certain ways. But you look for patterns, as Andreas did with the stuff he was showing you. And that's what we've done. What we did is what I'm about to show you is basically took the top achieving countries at eighth grade in the original Tim's work, and we used that to then develop, based on a very detailed analysis of their national standards, standards, whatever standards they have, it wasn't a federal pro, uh, national program, and we simply analyzed their textbooks and came to a deep understanding of what it was that those countries studied at each of the grade levels along the way. And that's the kind of work that I want to sort of summarize for you briefly. Uh, Laura asked me to just make a comment about the uh, how you do it. How you do it is, is very complicated, it's not easy, it's very costly, so it really wouldn't make much sense for individual states to try to truly do an international benchmarking study because you have to work with all these other countries to gather the data in all these different languages and code it into ways that you can then make sense of it to do analytical work to come up with some sort of a, a benchmark, if you will, in order to, against which to then compare a state's uh, set of standards or a district's set of standards. Well. Uh, what we did is to do that, and, and we analyzed hundreds of textbooks, every state, every country's standards. If the country didn't have one set of standards, we analyzed all the standards they had, such as the United States. Um, and what we've learned from that, I think, can be summarized in three characteristics. That what distinguishes those countries which are the top performing countries are curricular coherence, focus, and rigor. Let me just quickly define those for you. Focus is the fact that you have a small number of topics in a given year which you send, tend to focus on, thus giving more time to be covered for each of those topics. This is what we coined the phrase, the mile wide inch deep characterization of the US curriculum, where in fact you tried to cover so many topics, none of them in particular depth, depth leading to just continued repetition year after year. So the focus has to do with concentration on small numbers of topics and do them deeply and finish them so you don't have to keep repeating them. Rigor has simply to do with the fact that when you look across the rest of the world in the middle grades, it's algebra and geometry in the United States for the vast majority of children. I think it's changing, but it still is true for the vast majority. It's arithmetic, it's, al it's uh, uh, ratios, percentages, uh, fractions, things of that sort. And so when one has rigor, it means that as you move across the grades, the level of complexity of the content is increasing as you move across those grades. The last and the most important characteristic is coherence. And that I would simply define to you as any subject matter in school, and I talk specifically about mathematics, any subject matter in school uh, is derived from a formal academic discipline. And therefore, it isn't the same as what is done at the university level by those people who study that at field, but basically it must be consistent with the logical structure of that discipline. And that's what we call coherence. If the organization of the school curriculum, the topics and the sequence at which they're covered, the depth at which they're covered, where they are covered at which grade levels, all of that essentially, if that reflects the internal hierarchical in the case of mathematics, but generally internal logical structure of the formal discipline, then we call that coherence. That sounds so obvious, you might say, well, what's the alternative? I'll show you in a second. The alternative is you do this politically and you don't do it according to the discipline itself, but you simply have people who might know less about the academic nature of the discipline sort of vote as to what topics should be covered where. So these are the characteristics that are we so strongly found when we looked at a set of countries, the very top achieving countries, and asked what did they do in common? And what that led to was a, uh, a, a, a picture, if you will, to represent what we found. The mathematics topics are down the rows. It's not particular that you read, important that you read those. Across the top are the columns. There are eight of them for each of the eight grades. What you have in there is a pattern. That pattern is what the majority of the top achieving countries do with respect to their coverage of the typical mathematics topics pretty much covered everywhere in the world. So in other words, I want to point out here that it's not just in the United States we say, well, everybody covers fractions or everybody covers this topic or that topic. 
But it's not just coverage, it's where it's covered in the sequence of the rest of the mathematics. So it's not arbitrary where you put those little dots or squares. Those squares reflect the structure of the discipline. Notice the pattern is a sort of a, a triangular, uh, upper triangular sort of uh, matrix there. It's, there's the topics at the bottom are not covered until much later in the school system and only after the topics at the top of the list are covered earlier on. So that structure you see is in fact a reflection of the coherence that I'm talking about. And so you see the, the focus issue is look at the first two grades. They only cover about three, four topics in a whole year. They focus on basic ideas and don't worry about going beyond that. Rigor is when you look at the uh, last, the eighth grade, and you see things like the, the, the rational number system, congruence, very advanced mathematics topics, which most U.S. children, if they're lucky, may encounter in high school, but certainly not at eighth grade. And the coherence is just the pattern of that thing. Well, what's th this is what you can then go to benchmark yourself against, and we did that by analyzing state standards. Now, some of these states have now revised their standards further, but basically, this is what it looked like when we took a sample of 20, about 20 states. And it's the same pattern you should see as in the coherence model, but here you see uh, uh, dots everywhere. So in effect, the curricular structure not being based on a logic or internal structure of the discipline is sort of based on the philosophy that you cover, you cover everything everywhere because then somehow somebody will learn something somewhere. <laughs> and I suggest to you that's not a particularly good curricular philosophy for organizing a coherent, rigorous, and focused and demanding curriculum. Now one of the things that, uh, so this kind of benchmarking is possible to do and we have collected those data that enable this and we probably, in the t earliest Tim's work, were the first country to first study to really do this in a very academic, sophisticated way. This isn't people's opinions about what's covered. This is actually based on documents that, that stipulate what it is that is to be covered. Um, I want to pick, on, uh, pick up on one of the things that Andreas said when he showed you the, the performance. And he said you can uh, not just benchmark against the average, the mean, but you can also benchmark against the uh, the variation, and he showed you these different, um, differing amounts of variation in different countries. Well, I think that one of the things that we have as a consequence of this particular system we have in the structure, which is that states are in charge of education and every state has its own standards, as you see here, that one of the consequences of that is not just a lack of high quality performance, as he has shown from the means, but also this enormous amount of variation in our system. And that variation, which I consider to be one of, the, one of the worst aspects of the, in fact, almost the immoral aspect of our educational system, that kind of variability is in large part contributed by the variability that we have within our own system. That is, one of the things that you need to understand is the American educational system does not have common standards, and as a consequence, children in various parts of this country children of, of different ethnic and, and backgrounds and social class backgrounds, and simply two, two sets of children living right next to each other in identical communities do not have necessarily the same opportunities, content coverages to, to learn mathematics. And as a consequence, why would we expect to see anything other than the United States having a large amount of variability in performance? And I will show you this slide. This is at the state level. This is the most recent set of standards. We just completed that analysis. And if you remember what I said, that it's not just important to cover a topic, but a topic at a particular grade. So you have all these combinations, about 40 topics in eight grades. So you have, what, over 300 combinations. In how many of those combinations, I'll ask you this question, do you think that all 50 states, with their standards analyzed, actually do call for the same thing at, the, at that particular combination? Well, the short answer is none. There isn't a single solid dot on here. That means, therefore, that there is no particular grade level topic combination in which all 50 states call for the coverage of that content at that particular grade level. And the only open dots you see are where they agree not to cover something. And that's particularly um, insightful because they've agreed to not teach trigonometry at first grade, for example. So, <laughs> but those are about the only agreements we have. Now, this has implications, because I know yesterday you talked about common standards, the effort of the NGA and CCSSO. 
This is why it's essential that we look at those kinds of issues, because we have at the very core of the definition of the system huge inequalities implied by the fact that content coverage is not common uh, for most children. And that, that works its way. What are the consequences? Well, you go down just briefly. I'll show you a couple of slides. Now you ask how much time they spend on various topics. In grade two, arithmetic, this is based on 500 plus classrooms, so it's not just a small sample of data. Look at the variation on how much time is spent on basic arithmetic instruction in grade two across these, 50, these 500 classrooms. It goes from anywhere from about 20 days of instruction up to well over 140 days of instruction. That's a huge inequality is what I'm suggesting. And this is a consequence of us not having clearly defined standards that apply to all children. And hence, probably likely, very strongly contributes to the disparities in, in the performance that one sees in Andreas's earlier slide for the United States. And you can see it doesn't really get much better as you go up to grade eight and talk about algebra. Um, here's an example of one very large US city. And in this city, what you have is, this shows who actually ends up on the, sh the short end of it. The high SES schools spend about half their year in the green and the violet, which is algebra and geometry. In the same th low SES schools in the same district, they spend about a quarter of their time. What's the difference? They spend much more time simply going over again and again and again basic arithmetic. Now, why would you not expect performance on a state assessment or an international assessment to not be widely different and variable across those children, with, even within the same district, where in fact the notion of district standards or state standards in which the district resides is not even recognized in terms of, of, of this kind of disparity and opportunity. Well, I know that ADP is particularly interested in high school, so I want to show you a couple of slides of what happens there. I thought this is, instead of giving you tables, this is the best way to illustrate. This is a particular uh, district, high school. They have 30-some courses they offer in mathematics. That's really amazing, because I'm not even sure a university has 30-some courses in math. But anyway, every one of those arrows is some poor little kid trying to make its way, his or her way, <laughs> through four years of high school mathematics. And this is based on actual transcript data, so it's real. We didn't make it up. Well, when you don't have standards to the, to the point of the, of the um, quality and com being competitive internationally on those 15-year-old uh, tests that Andreas talks about with respect to PISA, well, if we just ask for a very simple thing, what if kids, in order to graduate from high school, had to have one course in mathematics, algebra two, and then biology, chemistry, and physics, okay? And less than 30% of US students, this is a nationally representative sample, less than 30% would meet that requirement and be able to graduate. This doesn't even layer on all the rest of the stuff they ought to have, like four years of English, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I only have data on these math and science. And so you can see that the, the system, and you know, if you, if you were to ask what percent of uh, black children would pass this, it's 20%. So why we, when we act, per, ask, act perplexed by the black-white achievement gap, I suggest to you there's a black-white curriculum gap in terms of opportunity. Um, and finally, I just want to show you that the US system is even more ludicrous than you might imagine in the absence of clear standards. Um, if you haven't figured out by now, I really strongly advocate the need for this nation to have common standards. <laughs> um, and the argument really rests strongly on the consequences of not doing it, which is what I'm trying to show you, which is, it fits nicely off of Andreas' slide. And this is a set of various courses that you find in sampling a set of, of districts that are called Algebra One courses. And I suggest to you that I'd like to, that probably applied algebra or adult ed algebra uh, is probably not the same as enrichment algebra or Algebra A and Algebra B and Algebra C. This is what the proliferation is in these American high schools. The ADP could hopefully put some sense to this. We find schools in which they have five or six or seven different Algebra for algebra one courses. We find high schools that have some 60 different high, 60 different, it's even hard for me to say, mathematics courses at the high school level because you have all these redundant variations on some common theme. This is my favorite slide. It's worth a laugh, if nothing else. These are all the general math if you don't make algebra one in your first year of high school. And my favorite here is the last one, last math. <laughs> or even 
senior math isn't bad either. I don't know if that means for seniors or for senior students, but life skills math, transitional math, this is what exists in a system that doesn't take seriously the notion of having standards to define what it is that children should learn. And this, I think, just supports the notion of this, of this uh, talk, of this uh, seminar here is that we, panel, is that we need to have international benchmarking because it's fine to look at one school and say, well, we do the same thing as that other school and internally look at yourself, but only do you really get a vision of how ludicrous our system is when you simply place it in the context of uh, another set of countries and look at what their standards look like compared to what our standards look like. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So I guess the cat is out of the bag that Bill supports the move towards common standards um, and actually has been talking about that for many, many years and has been charting the way for that. I, I think he's also pointed out uh, some of the challenges that we're going to face. Uh, if no state currently has any topics in the same grade level, um, that, that's quite a challenge for us as collectively to take on as we move forward. And so Andreas is going to share with us some thoughts about how to use assessment uh, to benchmark uh, students countries and, um, and hopefully states as well. Yeah, thank you very much. I want to <coughs> start by saying that out of benchmarking, some things <coughs> don't tell you very much. Some things are very important and you need to keep in mind what it takes to do that. Some things are easy to do and some things are much more expensive and harder to do. Of course, everybody wants to focus on the quick wins, not things that are important and easy to do. Nobody wants to spend some money on things that are very difficult to do and also not that important. Actually, I could show you lots of examples that fall in that category. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is important to move on to those that are tough to do but very important. They often not get lots out, uh, lost out and you need to uh, think about those things that you can pick up without too much effort even if they are not that important. As I've shown you, international benchmarking has become quite good in telling you what the individual institutional and systemic factors are that influence performance. No? We can now account for about 70% of the performance variability of schools across nations and states. So if we have a pretty good sense of what the characteristics of high-performing systems, high-performing schools, high-performing students are. I think that, that's something you can get today out of benchmarking. Monitoring progress is a much tougher thing to do. It sounds very easy. You just administer the same tests over time, but actually the things that are important are changing over time. And there's a lot of debate among countries internationally. What are those kinds of attributes that make people successful? What are those kind of skills that matter? And if you want to keep adapting to changing priorities and monitoring trends at the same time, it's quite a tough challenge. So I put it more to the left. As I said, I don't think that's really the rationale for states to get involved in this work, just to see where you are. Uh, I also believe there's a lot of effort of going into measuring similar things many times and assume that you get a different story every time. And there's a lot of sort of the resources put into that I think are quite significant. Measuring growth in learning, everybody talks about it, it's very hard to do as well. We're trying to do that internationally now too. Measuring sort of how well systems progress as students move through the different stages. And measuring, for example, which systems are successful in moderating the impact of social background as students grow older, and which systems does that impact actually increase. Measuring a broader range of competences. I mean, one thing is true, what you measure is what gets taught. I think that's a very simple story. Everybody knows it. So it's important to keep those measurement instruments extending towards competency areas that we haven't done dealt with so well. For 2009, this year, we're testing for the first time things like digital literacy. They are very important, harder to measure, but important. Sort of, I think that's a very important context. Now, how to do that, actually? First of all, this is just the countries that are currently, or that for which we have already collected data. We started in 2000 with the OECD countries, but now you can see actually almost 90% of the world economy covered. China, the picture is still quite patchy. We have only nine states in China out of the 21, and India only two, but sort of it's progressing, and I think um, we're getting more and more. And for most countries, we're now also getting state-level data. So states can benchmark themselves as if they were a country, not in terms of the outcomes, but in terms of the processes and 
For example, here, Australia, they do that. It's done by the national authorities there. Belgium, the regions take part as if they were countries in the international work. Brazil, the regions take part as if they were countries as well. Canada, Germany, these are just sort of the, the typical federal countries. So they can now not only see where they come out as nations, but where each every state can see where it fits into this picture, not just in terms of learning outcomes, but in terms of how schools operate, what they, how they are different, and things like this. Very briefly, and what it takes. One option is to actually run the assessment, to implement the PISA assessment as if you are a country that is expensive, resource intensive, or you can use TIMS or any of those international tests. The tests, what I should say, are quite different from what you may be used to. First of all, they're quite demanding on, on kids because we capture a quite comprehensive set of competences. They also take a broad range of response formats, only about half of our, actually a little bit less than half of our tasks are in multiple choice format. Many of them are open-ended. Some of them have constructed responses because we're not just interested whether students can reproduce what they have learned. We want to see to what extent they extrapolate from this and apply their knowledge in very complex novel situations. So I think that's the demanding side and scoring that is quite a difficult thing to do. We also collect a lot of contextual information and if you do benchmarking with whatever instruments. I would encourage you not to shortchange that part. If you don't collect that information, you can't explain your results. You can't see why your country is different, how your country or state differs from anything else. I think that's very, very important. Since the latest PISA, we're also collecting data from parents. To get a bit of a picture of the demands side, parental involvement, engagement, and so on. It's a quite heavy data collection, but I think very, very instructive. And um, the best evidence is really that any state or any country that has ever joined this process has remained in it. We have never lost a state and never lost a country doing this PISA. Every time it started as 28 countries, uh, now we are in the 70s and we'll soon move above the 80. Uh, also try to get data from school principals. That's sort of what most systems do in the world now, but it's expensive, resource intensive, there are alternatives. The first thing is, and many states and nations are doing that, is to just not look at, just not to administer a test, but to look at how do state standards, how do curricula vary, and how do they compare against those of other states and other countries. And I mean, it's a bit like the work that Achieve is doing. There's another way which some countries have pursued, and that is not to administer a whole PISA assessment, but to actually embed some of the PISA tasks in state tests or national tests. The only prerequisite there, you have to be careful, is that you have to make sure that what you measure is similar enough to make that worthwhile. And that warrants a very careful analysis. Um, some states, some nations also have embedded state items in the PISA test, it's the other way around. Sort of they have added, we have, our, our test design allows the addition of up to two new assessment booklets. So some, some countries have done that with their own national material. My own country started actually that work. It was very instructive because they said, well, this is what the OECD countries collectively think is important, but we have our own criteria of what is important in our own local and regional and, and national context. So they collected that information as well. And so at the end of the day, they were able to situate their national goals in the context of international ones and vice versa. And I should say, maybe that's, that's sort of a concluding remark to this, is that um, don't think of PISA as something that is produced by some international organization. The OECD is actually not that important in this process. It is a product that actually is developed in very hard work by the member countries of the OECD. They sit together, they think about what mathematics is and science is, and, and actually we're just in the middle at the beginning of this process. Um, and thank my thanks to achieve that is engaged in this process. It's a very, very difficult process to reach agreement. I mean, you try this in, in the context of your country. Imagine doing that at the global level, really figuring out what is it that mathematics is? How do you measure this? How do you actually build a test around this? Most of the tasks that you see in this exam is actually coming from some country, usually a high-performing country somewhere in the world. And <clears throat> you can link them to your own work, sort of. I think one of the... It's not just data coming out of this process, but there's also a lot of insights 
coming to those who participate in how to do this kind of work. Just the last word on the test items. Um, they differ from what you may just be familiar with. We put a lot of emphasis on authenticity in the task con context. We want to see to what extent students can actually use and apply knowledge. We have a high proportion of constructed response items. And so the, the nature of the test is quite different. But uh, the main products produce a set of basic indicators, the ones like the ones you have seen. We try to interpret them in a context. We look at changes over time. And that's, that's perhaps the most sort of fascinating part of the story. Most of the high-performing systems today were not among the high-performing systems 10 years ago. If you look at Finland, so-so. If you look at Korea, Japan, well, it's the last 10, 15 years that they do, were doing well. But 50 years ago, they were the bottom of the league, really, of international comparison. So how things are changing, how, how successful states and countries are in narrowing the gap between the better and poorer performing students and moderating the impact of social, uh, social background and things like this, all of that is coming out of this. But I just wanted to illustrate those several strands that you can pursue. One is, of course, to take part in the work as if you were a country, but also using some of the instruments, embedding them in state and local uh, instruments. And that allows you to draw on that information that you can get from elsewhere in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. A couple things to probe on later. In, really interesting ideas about how to embed PISA items in other tests. And then I think I heard you say embedding other items mm -hmm. into PISA booklets, which is something I hadn't thought about before. Hopefully someone will ask a question about that. Um, I should say that, um, as Andreas mentioned, Achieve is actually playing a role in taking a look at the p current PISA frameworks and making recommendations um, and considering how to revise the mathematics frameworks. Um, and we've just embarked on that work, so that's um, still to come, but we're looking forward to that. All right, I want to shift to Michael. Um, Michael, can you talk to us about um, how to think about internationally benchmarking systems and what some of the implications of what we've heard on system benchmarking might be? Oh, you need a microphone. Thank you, thank you, and I, I'll, I'll be brief because um, you, you've heard a lot from me already today. Um, but I, what I want to say is, uh, b before I start, is I think the work that Andreas and others at OECD and that Bill and others have done, um, and the, the whole of the TIMS and um, uh, other international comparisons has been incredibly valuable um, for people who run systems around the world. And more and more people that I meet running education systems in all the continents are paying attention to those results, not um, just uh, as the first reactions are, where am I in the rank order? But what does it mean for my system? What, in other words, it's providing a new and increasingly powerful evidence base for policy choices. And even if you go back 20 years, basically each system was working inside its own system thinking, what do I do now? And very often they were, uh, to put it crudely, guessing, um, but, but sometimes a bit more than that, but they, that's what they were doing. What you see increasingly over the last 15 to 20 years is leading um, people in education systems, politicians and the leading administrators, really seeking the evidence base. And the work that Bill, Andreas and a number of others have done has made that evidence base increasingly compelling. Many of you in the room have been following the education research for a while. If you, if you think back to the late 70s, early 80s, there was a lot of work then about how you measured school effectiveness. And by the end of the 1980s, we knew pretty much what an effective school looked like. There were lists that were eight, nine, 10, 11 characteristics of an effective school. And then we had a phase of research which was, well, if you, now we know what an effective school looks like, how do you make it effective? And that was school improvement, and there was a lot of research on that. What's happening now is, because of the work of people like these two, uh, we're able to define system effectiveness increasingly well. And the issue for people running systems, uh, as we get increasingly clear about what an effective system looks like, is how do you make a system effective? How do you become effective? So that exactly the same trend that happened with schools 20 years ago, we're now seeing at system level. And I think it's a really interesting frontier of um, education research and thinking. That's the first point I wanted to make. The, se the second point I wanted to make is my, my um, former boss, Tony Blair, used, so he, he, he um, does a variety of speeches now, but he started doing this when he was Prime Minister, he says basically that in the modern world, in the 21st century, the main issue between countries is not left or right as it was in the sort of classic Cold War era, but open or closed. 
Are you open to the rest of the world or are you closed? Are you inward looking or outward looking? Now, uh, you can argue that he exaggerates that, but it's a very, very important point. And many countries um, were quite closed and inward looking uh, on education until really the last decade. When I was um, first involved in education policy, managing the education reform in England in the late 90s, one of the civil servants came to me in 1998 and she said, we've been invited to join this um, international comparison. It was the Pearl's measurement of uh, reading performance that, that, that happens, uh, um, measures reading in, in the different national languages. And, and she said, we, we, we've been invited to join these things before and generally speaking, we don't join them. And I said, why don't you join them? And, and, and she said, well, what happens is they go away and they do these research. It costs some money and then it gets published and we're near the bottom of the league table. Our poor ministers get a terrible trashing in the newspapers and we just don't think it's worth it. And I said to her, look, by the time this test is, doing, is done, our national literacy strategy will have changed the position of our country in these league tables. Believe me, we are going to come out well in this. And even if we weren't going to come out well, we need to know. So anyway, we joined it. We had moved from the previous time, which was, they'd missed one, but we went from 17th in the world to third in the world. Um, now, so, so, so we, that, we then got on the um, um, process of getting into the international comparisons and England, um, leave aside Wales and Scotland for a moment, has gone up and down in those things. But as Andreas uh, uh, and uh, Bill were both saying, it's, it's how much you learn from that. There's a, there's a a one-day wonder story when you come out somewhere in a league table and you're either really good and it's on page nine of the newspaper or you're really bad and you're on page one of the newspaper, um, <laughs> like happened in Germany in the first round of PISA. But after that, it's what you do about it. And Andreas tells stories about the Spanish prime minister and the, the Mexican president and lots of people who see those results and they don't just worry about the media. They say, what does this mean for our system? How can we change what we do? And in this country, a really good sign of the opening up, which I think is happening really quite fast now in the United States, was when um, we were invited by uh, Mitchell Chester, who's now in Massachusetts, and Susan Zellman to come and internationally benchmark with Achieve the Ohio education system. They were saying, we've moved up the rank ordering of the 50 states, but we want to know how we're doing in terms of preparing our students for the global economy. What does that mean? So let's have a look at our system. So you can use the benchmarking data uh, that OECD, PISA, and Pearls and TIMS provide, and you can identify some systems that are consistently successful or, or more successful than many of the others. And then you can begin to say, well, what do they actually do? How do they do that? Um, and we um, did that report for Ohio, and we, we, we found a number of things about their standards, about their teaching profession, uh, about their funding system, uh, and other things uh, that they've been working through. Um, and it's tough. It's tough stuff to shift uh, since then. Um, we also, in McKinsey, then we did a report looking, taking all the data from all the international comparisons, 10 countries that did consistently well, how did they do that? 10 systems that improved significantly, how did they do that? And tried to identify the things they were doing. So we were, like, like happened for school effectiveness in the 80s, we were trying to get into system effectiveness yeah, in this decade. And we came up with a number of things, uh, largely to do with human capital, actually, which were the distinguishing features, and you saw some of that in Andreas's presentation. And I'll just pick out one or two things from that. I, I, I could talk for a long time, but I want to be very brief. One is how you recruit, retain, and then continuously develop teachers through their careers is absolutely fundamentally important. And if, as happened in America for a long time and the UK for a long time, you recruit teachers uh, as best you can from uh, people who can't think of anything better to do, and then they, you put them in classrooms and they shut the classroom door and nobody goes in for the next 40 years apart from the kids. That is a disaster. Why would we think that was going to work? How can anybody get better of a job if nobody comments? Did anybody, any of you see that Peanuts cartoon a few years ago where at the beginning of the week, Charlie Brown says he's going to teach the dog to sing by the end of the week? And the children obviously think this is a really good bet to take on. And they come back to him on a Friday and they say, the dog can't sing, we won the bet. And he says, no, I never said the dog would learn. I promised to teach him. <laughs> that, that, colleagues, is what we did for the whole of the 20th century. We taught some kids and they learnt it, and we taught, oh, sorry, we taught all the kids, some of them learnt it, some of them didn't, and then we went on and taught the next lesson. Good systems don't do that. They make sure that all the kids are coming along. When a kid doesn't learn, they say, how do I change my teaching to get that kid up to the standard? All the time. So, 
My final couple of points are this. Um, it's all in the detail. It's not in the headlines, it's in the detail. It's in the detail of how you implement, it's in the detail of how you uh, recruit teachers, retain teachers, develop teachers, in detail as you saw from Bill's presentation of how you set standards, how you organize mathematics as a, a, a process from age five to 16 or 17 or 18 or whatever uh, compulsory education ends in your country. And you've got to get into the depth. And this is one of the, we were talking about this this morning, the five types of benchmarking. This is a fundamentally important type of benchmarking, international benchmarking. What's more, in the countries, the federal countries that Andreas mentioned, where they're benchmarking provinces or states, like in Canada or Australia or Germany, it gets into national benchmarking as well, because you can begin to learn more effectively within the system. The debate in Australia is really interesting now, as the provinces, uh, the, the states compare themselves on their own data and the PISA data too. My, my, my final point is, uh, I think we're moving from a phase where, well, the first phase was where nobody learned much from anything, uh, from anybody, which is about 15 years ago. And now we're in a phase where you join these international comparisons if you're a system leader, and then when the results come out, you, you try to learn from them, and then you forget about it for a while, and then they come around again, into a phase where this is a continuous international dialogue. There are lots of networks. I was uh, with a, a group of education ministers in Singapore in June, eight education ministers from systems that came out well, trying to learn, uh, not just uh, from, the, from the analysis of this, but how do you implement that? Where are you gonna be in 2020? What aspirations do you have? Really systematic dialogue, fascinating. Uh, there is a thing that Andreas and I, uh, over the weekend, called the Global Education Leaders Program, where five or six systems from around the world are learning the same stuff. There's a whole series of international dialogues. So this is moving from not learning at all internationally to periodic learning to continuous dialogue. And for this country to achieve the aspirations it set uh, in the recent past and that you're all committed to, you need to be part of that continuous dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. There are mics walking around. Um, does anyone have a burning question for I'm going to start off, I mean, I heard the, the theme of the group was about change and how you use data to, to make good decisions and impact change. And I'm reminded of what uh, Craig Barrett said yesterday, that 90% of the revenue from Intel this quarter comes from products that didn't exist a year ago. That's rapid, rapid change. Um, and Andreas just reaffirmed that. He said, I think you said, most of the higher, highest performing countries today were not high performing 10 years ago. So that's pretty rapid change, given how slow systems move, and, and very inspirational. We together can impact great change. It's also a little daunting, given, given budget constraints and uh, the huge amount of um, things you could push on. If you had to choose one thing to do that was going to get you the most mileage, and you could tell the state leaders here what to do, what would that be? Anyone? <laughs> I really think given the fact that so many of these studies both nationally and internationally show the importance of content coverage, I think that the, this, the central thing that has to be focused on is making sure that this nation derives and gets a set of standards that are comparable to the rest of the world, the top achieving countries. And I have to say the only way to deal with the inequalities in this nation is to make it so that it's for all. I mean, it, everything has sort of, you need to see it against the time axis, but one thing that you can do very quickly and that in many of the high performing countries is one of the key attributes is that every teacher knows what good performance is. They have a very clear concept of what students should be able to do and they don't necessarily define minimum standards, but they do articulate what good performance really means. That's quick to do. Then of course you can talk about how you get the people who can, can deliver it, sort of that's a recruitment, attracting, retraining and keeping excellent teaching staff. That's sort of a longer term agenda, but I think the, the first thing to do, and that's the, the first attribute of almost any of the best performing systems, is to be clear about what good performance is, really. I, I mean, my, my answer question, well, given, given the agenda that's been set by the new administration of the four assurances, that the, the, the standards, the teacher quality, the data, uh, and the dealing with uh, underperforming schools, that is a very sensible agenda uh, for uh, what needs to be done. So my, my advice and answer to your question will be rigorously implement the things that have been set as the agenda for the country. And if you do that, you'll see real change within a relatively small number of years. Thanks. Um, questions, I see, Alice, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I was just wondering, can you um, tell a little bit about the difference between the TIMS uh, test and um, the PISA test? Is there, 
benefits uh, over one over the other? Um, I think it's, it's hard to... Cost? Uh, <coughs> really is. They, they, um, they are similar assessments. The main difference is that PISA is very much concerned with testing whether students can extrapolate from what they know, apply their knowledge in a novel context. Content is one domain, but sort of the concept of com competence is a very sort of key criteria in there. But um, I mean, most of the systems that do well on TIMS also do well on PISA. The exceptions are the East Asian systems. They come out usually very high on TIMS because TIMS is so much concerned with the reproduction of subject matter content. That's very well trained in the East, uh, East Asian systems. They come out a little bit lower on PISA. Um, for the United States, the difference isn't that, that, that pronounced. So, uh, Country coverage, of course, is very different. I mean, PISA is assess an assessment that is geared towards the industrialized world, the high end of the skill spectrum, and TIMS, I think, the pre predominantly middle-income countries now. No? Yeah, pretty much now. It wasn't originally, but now. Yeah, I mean, one is at age 13, one is age 15, so I think there are differences like this, but, but I, I, I think that both systems are benchmarking, really. I, I thought one was about grade level and the other about mm. a, uh, actual age. Is mm. that, does that make a difference yeah, to the result? Yeah. 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 Tim's is, I, I, just, I agree with what Andrea said. I would just add one comment, and that is that the, the Tim's is driven by association with a particular grade, so it's more directly in the sampling is to sample classrooms. So it's more directly tied to the school curriculum and what's taught, whereas the PISA is, a, is an age-based thing and is trying to look at a cumulative set of things, and as he said, that's more directly applicable to real world. Other questions? Achieves analysis of countries, um, we, we tried to actually take a read on what, what high-performing countries were by using both tests as a filter. So countries that did particularly well mm. on both um, were obvious choice in terms of what countries to look at. And Nobody asked a question, but I'll make a quick comment if I could. And that is, um, when you ask your question, I was immediately uh, thinking about the fact that Minnesota is a good example uh, where, in fact, they took this benchmarking from the original Tim study and worked on the, their curricular standards very hard. They didn't have any before the, the in place when they first took Tim's in 95. And I suspect most of you know the story of how greatly they and their fourth graders improved. And I think that's a good illustration. I mean, mm. I can't prove it. It's not causal inference. But I think it's a really good indication of what Michael said, that if you do this, you begin to get results and, and fairly quickly. And just to add one other comment, because Michael was also saying about, and I think Andre said this too, the, the, the preparation of teachers. Well, there is a study going on, and the results will come out on the plan right now is sometime in January, that will give some initial results on a new benchmarking effort, which is how teachers are trained to teach mathematics, both at the elementary and the middle school level. So those results should become available. Uh, and uh, we have in the United States a sample of 100 public and private institutions, a random sample. Uh, first time ever that we've got a real good sample of these kids, what they know, and uh, how they've been trained. So all of that will become available uh, shortly. Another set of benchmarking data. We have time for one more question. Mitch Chester? Project. A little, little, uh, uh, little um, specific uh, to Andreas. Uh, I understand that the two, well, there is another uh, distinction cause, because PISA uh, assesses reading, math, and science. And I, my understanding is, is that on the 2009 PISA, uh, you, you did some pretty innovative things in terms of looking at uh, reading and literacy in, um, in the digital era, uh, kind of non-continuous text, the, the kind of reading that more and more is part of what youngsters do uh, in school and out of school. Love to hear you talk a little bit about that because I think that's really, um, really interesting. Yeah, and in PISA, in fact, at every assessment, we try to look at one innovative assessment area, like um, <coughs> problem solving. And now in 2009, it is digital literacy. Uh, we were particularly interested to what extent young people master the kind of, I mean, reading is one thing, but to a master who can build mental representations of nonlinear text, which is what you confront if you want to effectively use the internet, for example. 
You, know, you see bits and pieces, but can you actually not just get lost in a, in a hypertext, but can you actually meaningfully draw inferences, compare, contrast, reflect uh, information? So we built that test into the PISA assessment. Computer delivered, our aim is actually to put the whole PISA assessments into a computer delivered format over, over time also to just in, uh, decrease the time it takes to, to administer that. And um, it is very interesting. I mean, we don't have yet a um, complete picture. We have the uh, results from the field trial, but you can actually see there are different kinds of cognitive <laughs> skills involved in using traditional text and digital uh, literacy. And um, that's something I think ver it's, is very important. In 2012, we are thinking about what we call collaborative problem-solving skills. School, I mean, everybody talks about interpersonal, the importance of interpersonal skills, but at the end of the day in the school, you get your own in individual exam. <laughs> and we're trying to build that dimension into the assessment in 2012. So that's, the, the aim is really to assess reading, math, and science every time. That's always done on a predictable basis with trend data and so on, but to include <coughs> one sort of more innovative assessment every three years. Please join me in thanking this fabulous panel. <laughs> I want to note for the record that I did get this panel out the door at 1.59, and we're going to transition over to Mike Cohen. Thank you all. Thank you, Laura. And uh, I just want to take two minutes before you all depart. First of all, to thank all of you for the time and commitment you've made to participating in this conference and to the work you're doing all year long. If you weren't tackling the tough issues as well as you are and making as much progress as you've been, these kind of gatherings across states wouldn't be as useful as they are, wouldn't give you the opportunity to learn from each other the way you have. So we thank you for what you're doing. We hope you've learned uh, nearly as much from each other as we've learned uh, from you. Uh, secondly, we listen very hard to the issues you're struggling with and to the needs that you have. And I want to just assure you that that will play a role in the work that we do uh, in the year to come and in the way in which we think about this conference going forward. Thirdly, to help us do that, you all have an evaluation and comment form, which I hope you'll fill out so we can take your feedback into account when planning this uh, uh, conference for next year. Uh, finally, uh, uh, a number of people I want to thank here for making this conference what I think has been a tremendous uh, success. All of the Achieve staff have worked on this conference, and they have worked on, on your behalf all year long, and I hope you'll just take a second to acknowledge them. <laughs> We, we, at Achieve, I'm proud we have an absolutely first-rate team, a uniformly high-quality, strong, uh, strong staff, and they work really hard on your behalf. There are several people I particularly want to uh, acknowledge. Uh, uh, Alyssa Peltzman, uh, who you all see as the conference manager here. What you probably don't realize is she planned the whole conference and she planned it to make sure, the whole agenda, to make sure that this responds to your needs. So she's been working very hard on this along with her, her team, uh, who I'd also like to thank Leslie Muldoon, Allison Kamara, and Dominique Wigglesworth. So please just give them a round of applause. Thank you. Travel safe, good luck getting home, call us if you need us, we're committed to working on behalf of your success all year long. Thank you very much.